After traveling all through Morocco, through the desert, over the mountains, it was finally great to get to the Atlantic coast and see some amazing seafood. Before I leave Morocco for Spain, I want to cram in some beach in big city. So what could be better than Casablanca? I don't know if they're doing this to be happy just because I'm here or they're trying to build an avatar, but it's pretty fun. I get to try one of Morocco's greatest gifts to the world, argan oil. This is a woman's co-op where they've been producing this argan oil in a traditional way for years. And in the coastal town of Essaouira, I discover a seafood smorgasbord with a definitive Moroccan touch. Real old school in here. Sardines in, tails and everything, straight through the mincer. Beautiful seafood in Morocco's coast. Got me thinking of a couple of dishes. They're going to pack them in here like sardines. Order in. I battled through the markets of Marrakesh and Fez, made it all the way through the Sahara, over the Atlas Mountains, and finally I've made it here to the amazing coastline of Essaouira. Morocco's coastline stretches from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, and I'm going to travel from the walled seaport of Essaouira up to the bright lights of Casablanca. Essaouira has been a strategic harbour for centuries. It's the closest seaport to Marrakesh, and it provided a crucial link between the sub-Saharan traders and the rest of the world. Essaouira has been a fishing village ever since my ancestors, the Phoenicians, came here back in 7th century BC. And there's always one surefire way to tell it's a cracking seafood town whenever these blokes are hanging around. Although you've probably never realised it, you've quite possibly eaten fish that come across this very wharf. Morocco is the world's largest sardine exporter. Most of the stuff ends up tinned, packaged and sent overseas, but when you get a chance to see it fresh like this, it's always something to smile about. But nothing broadens my smile further than sardines cooked over hot coals. And just down from the fish markets, you can find more stalls than there are seagulls. It is stupid not to get your fix of seafood while you're in this town. You can sit here with the tourists in the tourist part and have a good feed and pay top dollar. But you can follow me and I'll show you where the real people eat. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. 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 you. Thank 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 you you'll find the fish market where the locals shop at. The sardines look and smell really fresh and they've been lightly salted already and that's going to help when we grill them over coal because what it does, it draws out the moisture and helps get a nice crispy skin. I can't go past my little favourite. Maybe one of those. Let's get one brim. I've been told that this bloke cleans it and this guy cooks it. And the way that guy's holding the knife, I don't think I've got a choice. He's definitely got to be the one cleaning it. So uh, there you go. I couldn't pass up the chance to buy some fresh caught brim, which has been scaled, gutted, then butterfly cooked over the coals. Yum. Ah, uh, there we go. Jeez. I think I might have bought a bit too much fish. <laughs> so, let's get stuck into it. And the sardines are really fresh and really tasty. But the bit that I really like, it's my little gem over here. I love brim. Simply grilled, really moist. Nice and sweet. It's one of my favourite fish. I don't know if I can eat all those sardines, but I definitely can eat all that brim. Unlike most Moroccan towns, Essaouira is laid out in a grid, giving it a more European vibe. But follow your nose and you can be sure to find some great street food. No, you're not seeing double. Saeed and Mohammed are twin brothers who, according to the word on the street, make some of the best sardine kefta in Essaouira. Real old school in here. Sardines in, tails and everything, straight through the mincer. Everyone choking a bone. <laughs> All throughout Morocco, I've seen a lot of spice used, generally the same types in different quantities. Here, they're huge amounts, and it's good, it's great for me. I, I love seeing a lot of spice used. I think the main reason, sardines are a big flavour, so they're going to need a lot of spice to help punch that and mellow it out and bring out the flavours, both in the sardine and in the spice. It may be smaller, a bit more rustic than my restaurant, but the rhythms are the same, and I'm hungry. Seven dinner. That's a buck for all that.
You know, this stuff gives street food a new meaning. We are right in the middle of the street. But I've been dying to get into this cupta. Oh. Yeah, well, that's really good. It's kind of like a, you know, what you'd expect from a fish cake. The sardine flavour isn't really strong. All the spices have kind of mellowed it out. And for the amount of chilli he put in there, it should be really hot, but it's not. Those sardines cooked over coal were a knockout. And the sardine kefta had really good amounts of spice. But I wanted something a bit more fresh, a little bit more creamy. But I think it's got the bones of a good dish. So I'm going to mix some sardines with some blue eyes, some white fish. And this stuff isn't really fishy. But what it's going to do, it's going to tone down the flavour of the sardine and just make it a little bit easier to eat. So I'm going to start with the blue eye or the white fish and then add my sardine. Now, the sardines have just been filleted and minced. Some dried breadcrumbs. Better to add a little bit now and then a little bit later. For the flavour, I'm adding garlic, chilli, mint, paprika and some turmeric. But to kind of soften it and just cut through some of that fishiness, some lemon and a little bit of fresh herb. I'm going to put some parsley in there. All right, so that's all mixed together. And all I'm going to do now is roll them into balls. You want them sort of like golf ball size, I suppose. I saw and ate a million different tagines when I was in Morocco. And now that I'm in Esauera, I thought, why not cook a fish one? I'm just going to seal off all these little sardine balls. And it's important to get it nice and hot because I want to release that flavour. And already that's smelling great. While it's sealing on the other side, I've got some of these shallots. They're called banana shallots just because they're long, but they're great because they hold together. Some sliced garlic, grated tomato, heaps better than tin tomato. Some saffron stock, which is just saffron threads, a little bit of powdered saffron and water, just brought up to the boil. And the last thing I'm going to add is some grated carrot. Now, the carrots I had in Morocco were amazing, and I thought this would be a great way to add some vegetables, but also some natural sweetness to that really intense sardine. For my flatbread, I'm using a classic bread dough mixed with mashed potato, which will give the bread a fluffy and light feel. So I've got a bit of semolina, and all I'm going to do is cut this into some even pieces. You could roll this out with rolling pins, or you could keep it nice and rustic. And that's what I'm going to do. Now it's time to cook. Medium heat in the fry pan will make it nice and crispy on the outside, keeping it fluffy on the inside. Oh, that's perfect. Really nice and brown. And as soon as I turned it, the bread started puffing up, so it's really nice and airy and light in there. I reckon it's time to eat. Now to see if those carrots have all cooked down and those little kefta are ready. Ah, perfect. So I'm just going to serve on the top of this some fresh herbs, coriander, mint, parsley, my own little chamula spice with some preserved lemon. And with this bread dipped in that tagine, honestly, that's a great way to round up the flavours of Esauera. I'm starting the day with a typical Moroccan brekkie that features an ingredient that's endemic to the hills behind Esauera. So there's this thing in Morocco called amlu. Now, it looks like peanut butter, but it's not peanut butter. It's the Moroccan peanut butter. Typically served on bread like mesmen, it's basically a blend of almonds and honey. But what makes it really different, it's got argan oil in it, which is a toasted nut native to Morocco. Really gorgeous flavour. And for breakfast, it's just a ticket. The rolling hills behind Esauera are where the argan trees grow, and the argan oil is extracted from their fruit. It's a laborious, time-consuming job, traditionally and, of course, performed by women. So this is the argan fruit, and inside the fruit holds the nut, which produces that amazing argan oil. This is a woman's co-op where they've been producing this argan oil in a traditional way for years. Argan oil can be both culinary and cosmetic, but the process is roughly the same. Once the kernels are separated from the fruit, they need to be ground into a paste. If the oil is for eating, the kernels are roasted. Once a paste is formed, water is added and the oil is extracted by hand. Now, as you can see, this is a really labour-intensive process. The traditional method of extracting 
has gone through so many stages and it's all done with hands, just to produce a little bit of oil. Thankfully, newer technologies for extracting it are starting to come online. The result is not just a more efficient supply chain, but a better quality product. <laughs> Ulysses moved here from Switzerland, bringing with him some of that famed Swiss engineering prowess. So that's the way the fruits come here. When we buy it, uh, and here you have the fruits, dried in the sun of Africa. They're dried on the tree or they? No, that they, they have to fall down, yep. and then you, you dry it uh, uh, down under the trees. 60 kilos gives uh, four kilos of kernels. Wow. And four kilo of kernel is about uh, two liter of organ oil. It's not a high yield, is it? No, no. Very low yield. Yeah. So you produce everything here in, in your factory? Yes, but before we press it, we toast it. I can show you that. Great. I can show you that. Instead of toasting over fire, Ulysses browns his kernels for half an hour in a heated spinning drum. But it's his method of extraction that really revolutionised this process. So this is the extraction room. So oh, this is where it becomes oil. Yeah, exactly. He, he puts the kernels in there, then they are pressed cold, and the residue, it's called residue, comes out. That's this. Yes. And does this get used for anything? Yes, for uh, food for, for animals. Oh, so like, okay. So this looks a lot different from the process that I saw, you know, with those girls crushing the nuts and grinding it. And... This way you get out 99% of the oil. The traditional way you get out about 60%. Oh. The other reason is you don't put water on it. Water is one of the enemies of oil. You destroy the oil. Once filtered, the oil is ready to be bottled. It may be a more modern mechanical process, but this is still pure, cold-pressed oil full of omega-6. And this is the product that I buy, isn't it? Yes, that's your product. Yeah. In a way, argan oil is similar to a high-quality hazelnut oil, but with a unique flavour of its own. For me, I want to do a dish that highlights this without overpowering it, and I think beef might be the perfect base. This dish is going to be really simple and filled with flavour. I'm going to make some roast wagyu beef with a roasted cauliflower hummus dressed in amlu, which I thought was awesome, sort of that Moroccan peanut butter or Nutella. This is the rum cap, and to me, it's the best cut of meat to cook and eat because it's full of flavour and tastes like beef. In a hot pan, I'm just going to seal that on the skin side or on the fat side just to render down, give it a flip, put it in the oven, Beef's roasting, time to make the hummus. Now, hummus doesn't just have to be hummus. It doesn't always have to be chickpea, tahini and lemon. That can be a good base, but you can manipulate the flavour in any way you like. And I think some roast cauliflower with the beef and the argan oil is going to be an awesome flavour combination. Easy way to make it. I'm starting with a standard hummus base. Chickpeas, garlic and tahini. And to this, I add my pureed roasted cauliflower. Beautiful. For me, hummus needs to be nice and fine and pureed, so it's like velvety. This is great on its own, so it's going to be awesome with the beef. Four minutes in the oven, and the beef is ready. Ah, spot on. That's really rare. So my take on the amlu dressing, roasted almonds, some honey, some sherry vinegar, and of course, the magic argan oil. Quick blitz. Looks great, nice and coarse. It's going to add some texture to the dish. A couple other things I want to add to it. A touch of Aleppo pepper. I haven't really seen a lot of it in Morocco, but it's definitely got that flavour of sort of Moorish cooking. Some chives, diced shallots, and a splash more of that argan oil, just to loosen it up. And that's going to be my textural, sexy garnish that pulls all the beef together with the roasted cauliflower. And this beef is beautiful. Some of that amlu dressing, not too much. I don't want to overpower the beef, I want to complement it. Hummus in the plate, don't be shy. Just want to make a bit of a cavity in the middle to hold this salad. Oh, yeah. That's looking really good.
Before heading across to Spain, I've arrived in the largest and busiest city in Morocco. So welcome to Casablanca. It's a little bit different to the romantic vision you have in your head that Humphrey Bogart painted in that amazing movie. This is a major city. Heaps of traffic and these little petty taxis are everywhere. It's hard to believe that before the French colonised Casablanca, this was a tiny fishing village. To show me around what's now a global city, I'm meeting up with an old friend, Sophia Palmer, who has recently written a Moroccan cookbook with her Australian husband. Hey, Sophia. Hey, how are you? Good. Nice, nice to, to see, see you. you. Welcome to Casa. So you've got me here in your hometown. I'm looking forward to seeing what it's got to offer. Yeah, look, this is the Habus Quarter. Yeah. Um, and this is the French that built it in the 1930s. The Habus Quarter is what happens when the French attempt to design an Arabic-style Medina. Neat alleyways hide shops and markets, and there's even a town square in front of the mosque. Compared to the city, like it's more quiet, it's you know nice, it's not as crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm gonna get run over. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it's less crazy sometimes. Sometimes. To give me a good send-off from Morocco, Sophia has invited me to a party at her family's home. I've been charged with bringing the sweets. So we're heading to one of Casablanca's most famous bakeries. So this is where uh, we, my family, we always come and buy uh, lots of uh, patisserie. Hakim's family have owned the patisserie for three generations and their signature pastry is the corn de gazelle. Ah, oh, yeah. Ah, the corn de gazelle. Have a try. Mm. How good is that? It's good. It's like crunchy on the outside. Yeah, and soft like inside. And soft in the it's really nice. Mm. These corn de gazelles are Benice Patisserie's top seller. And upstairs, the bakers are hard at work. So the pastry looks almost like a pasta dough. What, what, what's the... Can I touch the pastry? Yeah, you can. Oh. Wow, look at that. That's mega thin. Look how stretchy it is. Is it just flour, water? Yeah, flour and water. The sweetness comes from the almond. Yeah, from the yeah. filling. Yeah. So how many, would the, how many would these guys make every day? Every day it depends, it's like uh, 50 or 60 like that. Trays? Yeah. Trays. Trays. And, and how many in a tray? Like 60 or 70? Yeah. A lot of work, all done by hand. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Shukran, Shukran. Across the alleyway from the shop is a public oven where the corn de gazelles are baked until golden brown. The pastry shrinks during the process, allowing the filling to dominate. These, along with some other tasty treats, will definitely win me brownie points with Sophia's family. Hello! Sophia! Oh, my Sophia, how are you? Nice to see you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Salut. Hi. Sophia's mum is one of six daughters, and I've been told to brace myself for their welcoming song. <laughs> for a bit of a peace and quiet. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so this is where it all happens. Sophia's mum and aunts all have their own specialty, starting with Auntie Aisha's famous veal tagine with prunes, almonds, and quail eggs. Le tagine mariné la veille. So you have to marinate it the day before, right? Avec, de, avec, euh, avec des épices et on fait cuire ça à petit feu. Le secret. Non, on la veille, on les laisse. Ouais, et on la les laisse. Ouais. Comme ça, ils sont massés. <laughs> you know what Too, too many chefs spoil the broth. Sophia's mum, Zuzu, is doing a classic chicken tagine with preserved lemons and olives. There's also a variety of salads. Baklua is made from spinach and preserved lemons. Zaluk is eggplant based. And finally, taktuka, a fresh tomato and capsicum mix. And what Moroccan feast would be complete without my favourite soup, harira? We're ready to eat. It's good. <laughs> there's nothing more special to me than a feast shared with family. Although at my house, there's usually a bit less dancing. I don't know if they're doing this to be happy just because I'm here or they're trying to build an appetite, but it's pretty fun. <laughs> I wonder when it's time to eat, though. Yeah. 
The chicken is really good. It's all beautiful. Thank you very much for having me in your home. It means a lot to me. And uh, I couldn't think of a better way to finish my journey of Morocco than being here with you guys. So thank you very much. It means the world. <laughs> Although I'm sad to be leaving Morocco, I look forward to getting into Andalusia and tracing these Moorish culinary influences as they merge with the food of Europe. But before I do, there's one more dish I need to prepare for the restaurant. And after my trip to Benis Patisserie, it has to be a dessert. This is one of my favourite chocolate recipes. It's a caramelised chocolate brownie. I've never used it with argan oil, but I'm going to add some to it. I reckon the flavours are going to work really well. So to get started, three eggs. Need to whisk it up with some brown sugar. Add that in. So I need to leave that whisk until it comes really nice and aerated. While that's happening, I've got some chocolate over here, which I've just been melting over a double boiler. I'm going to add some argan oil, and that's going to put the flavour of this oil all through the brownie. And you can smell it straight away. As soon as you add a little bit of heat to that argan oil, it really sort of jumps up and punches in the nose. I'm just going to turn that down and gently start pouring that chocolate in. All that needs to happen now is I've got some creme fraiche straight in, some dark cocoa powder and some baking powder. And then gently, I'm just going to fold that through. I don't want to knock out all that air. I think there's nothing better when a brownie is nice and gooey. Salted caramel, move aside. This is caramelised chocolate, and it is the bomb. And all I've done is just put those on some baking sheets um, on a tray in the oven until they've gone nice and gooey and brown, chilled them, and they're going to give a nice crunch in the middle of that brownie. If you like chocolate, this is definitely going to be something you're going to love. Pour that in. Now, if I was at home, I'd give this to my son and he'd wear it all over his face. <laughs> So that's just going to go 160 degrees, 45 minutes, long and slow. Brownies straight on the plate. Orange and cinnamon are the flavours of Morocco. So I've combined them into an ice cream. I know it doesn't look like Morocco, but let me tell you, that's the flavours of Morocco. Argan oil, orange, cinnamon, all brought together with a gooey brownie. These are my last three Moroccan-inspired dishes before I head across to Spain. And with my staff across the recipes, it's time to serve it to the customers. My first dish is my sardine kefta served with potato bread. The kofta here was, was, was by far the best dish, Shane. I love that. There's even a couple of garlic cloves in there I was fighting for. It was <laughs> delicious. That bread was just the best. <laughs> Put that much salt on anything, it's going to be great. Second, argan oil is still a relatively new taste for many people. Does my cauliflower hummus with wagyu beef dish do it justice? It was one of the freshest sort of menus that I've had here in an agency. Yeah, really good. Good. And finally, my argan oil chocolate brownie has been served to my toughest critic ever, my wife Maha. I thought the chocolate. Yeah, of course you like the chocolate. Definitely my favourite. I did something better than a you. A little bit better. As they say, happy wife, happy life. <laughs>